If you have your Bible with you today, let's turn back to John chapter 10. Church, John chapter 10, we are still in verses 22 through 42, where Jesus again is making his last public appearance before stepping away for about a two-month period of time, only to return for Passion Week. Church, only to return for his triumphal entry into Jerusalem that led straight to his crucifixion. And I've shared with us inside this passage are five different scenes playing out. Five different scenes taking place between the religious leaders and Jesus Christ. If you look there inside your notes page in your bulletin, you'll see that two weeks ago, we looked at scene number one. Church between verses 22 and 42, we saw where the religious leaders made their confrontation against Jesus Christ. A strong confrontation, asking bluntly in verse 24, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. We looked at this this, uh, confrontation extensively, if you will, realizing these religious leaders had no desire to hear Jesus' response. They didn't truly care who Jesus was. Truth be known, they wanted Jesus removed from the public front. Jesus had come on the scene, and the crowds had begun to follow Jesus. They'd been coming to Jesus. They'd been running to Jesus for their answers, and these religious leaders were losing their power. They were losing their authority. They were losing their place before the people, and they wanted Jesus out of the way, so they confronted him. Then last week, we looked at scene number two. In verses 25 through 29, and again, we saw this scene being the claim or the response of Jesus Christ, and that came in two forms. First, we looked at the claim inside of his witness in verses 25 and 26. Jesus saying this, the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness of me. So Jesus pulls his claim out, says, look at my works. They claim to you, they proclaim to you who I am. And then secondly, we looked at his claim of security in verses 27 through 29, where Jesus says, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Church, these are some major claims for Jesus to be making in front of these religious leaders. And we can't help but see the response in verse 31. It says, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. I take note of that word again. Realizing that this is actually the fourth time that they've tried to kill Jesus. Four different times, Jesus has made strong claims of his Messiahship and the fact that he is the Christ, he is the Son of God. And every time he's made such a claim, they've attempted to kill Jesus. And that's where we're picking up this morning inside of this passage, John chapter 10. I'm going to shorten it up, if you will, since we've already looked at the first two scenes. I now want to kind of focus in on verses 32 through 42 in these last three scenes, if you will. So please stay with me, if you will, as we read this closing part of the chapter, John chapter 10, verses 32 through 42. And Jesus answered, Many good works have I shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. And Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and he says to them, Scripture can't be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world that you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If you do not believe the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that they may be known and be- that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore, they sought to seize him and he escaped out of their hand. Verse 40. And he went away again beyond the Jordan River to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. Then many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true, and many believed in him there. Many believed in Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, I pray this morning. I pray this morning for the power of your Holy Spirit to move amongst us, God, that you would open our eyes to see, God, as only you can. You'd open our ears to hear as only you can. God, I pray that you'd use me to speak your word. God, not one word of my own, but only the words that you give me 
to understand, Lord God, how this even applies into us today. God, move in our hearts, move in our lives, stir us for the glory of your name, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This morning, I want us to pick up in scene number three there inside your notes, if you don't mind, church. Scene number three, and that being the charge. Stepping right back into our study here, church, looking at scene number three, the charge. This is the religious leader's charge against Jesus in verse 33. But before we even look at that charge, I want to take a second, if you don't mind, to listen to the question that Jesus asks them as they're literally taking up stones to come up against him. Look at verse 32. I'll put it on the screen. He says, many good works have I shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? Church, that's Jesus' response. I'm going to kind of put this back in context if you don't mind again. Jesus has been proclaiming to them who he truly is. At this point in time, these religious leaders have reached down on the ground, and they have picked up stones, and they're fixing to stone Jesus. And this is his response. Many good works have I shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? They're ready to stone him, and that's his response. Do you know what takes place at a stoning? Has anybody ever looked back up in history to realize how a stoning took place? Let me give us a little background, if you don't mind. I did some research, and there are four different ways that they stoned people in Jesus' day. The first was this, against a wall. I put a picture of a drawing on screen because most of the, the real photographs that they showed of this were very graphic, and I didn't want to put it out before you. But what they would do is they would take the individual that they found to be guilty and they would place them up against a wall. And the judges would surround that, that man that's a, a guilty in a half circle up against that wall where they could not move. And they would pick up stones and throw them at that individual causing, causing blunt force trauma until death occurred. Sound good to anybody? Anybody want to try it this morning? Didn't think so. The second way was by tying, to them, a ground, to, uh, tying them to the ground. And I could not find a picture that was visible for you this morning that you would actually be able to watch and appropriately see. This is how it took place. They would take these individuals, put a rope across each wrist and across each ankle, and they would spread them out on the ground and stake, put stakes in the ground by each of their hands and wrists and their feet. And they would tie that rope to the stakes where they could not move. The judges would surround them in a circle, taking up stones in their hand, and they would throw those stones down on top of them, causing blunt force trauma unto death. Anybody want to try that one? I didn't think so. The fourth means was by, by burying them chest deep into the ground. I've got a picture of this one, and it kind of blurred out the individual where you can't see the individual. But they would take them and bury them about chest deep, arms down, and bury them in the ground where they cannot move. The guilty party is buried where they cannot move. Again, these judges would surround them, picking up a stone and coming over top of them and throwing them until they caused that blunt force drama that caused death. And then the fifth scene was this one, church by placing them in a pit. They would dig a pit probably about nine, ten foot deep, and they would throw them down on the bottom of that pit, and again the judges would surround them and throw stones down on them, causing blunt force trauma until death. If you had to pick one of those four, which one do you want? Because I didn't like one, and I wasn't particularly fond of number two either, but I didn't like number three or number four. What about you? Because I want to remind you again this morning, this is where Jesus is at. These men have now picked up the stones in their hand, and they're fixing to stone Jesus. He's been at stonings before. He's seen a stoning before. He knows what's about to take place. How would you respond if you were in one of those four moments? People were starting to pick up the stones, and they were starting to come at you, and you knew what was fixing to take place. How would you respond? I've tried to put myself there this morning. I'm thinking I would either run or scream. There's not a doubt in my mind. I might like to think I'd be a man about it, but that's not the way I want to go. I promise you. But yet here's Jesus sitting in this moment, and they're about to stone him, and yet calmly and collectively he says to them, many good works I've shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? Church, Jesus is not pulling back in protection mode. He's, he's not fearing for his life. He's not crying out to the Father, deliver me from this moment. Calmly and collectively, he points them back to his works. The same thing he's been doing since chapter 5 and verse 36 when he said this, I have a greater witness than John, speaking of John the Baptist. He said, for, for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do 
bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. He's telling them again, if you don't believe my words, if you don't want to strongly listen to the things that I'm speaking, just look at my works. Look at the miracles that I'm performing. Jesus, at this point in time, has healed the sick. Jesus has fed the multitudes. He's touched the demon-possessed and freed them. He's even raised someone from the dead. He says, my works speak loud enough. Believe in my works. And how do they respond? Look at verse 33, church. Here's their charge coming into scene number three. They answered, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. There's the charge that they come back at Jesus with. Church, they're charging him with blasphemy. This is, again, I've spoken this several weeks in a row now. This has been their desire the entire time for Jesus. They have been looking for an opportune moment to pin him, if you will, to trap him into saying what they needed him to say so that they would believe that he was committing blasphemy. The last part of verse 33 saying, you make yourself God. Hear me this morning. I've heard a lot of people come to me and make claims about Jesus Christ. Even as a pastor for over 25 years now, I've had people in my time come and share with me different claims concerning Jesus Christ, even some of my professors. And some of them making claims just like this. You know, David, if you look at things, Jesus never claimed to be God. I don't know why they took up stones at him. He never actually made that claim. And when I look at them, and these, these are intellectual individuals, I look at them and I, I feel frustrated sometimes. But then I kind of feel sorry for them because I realize as I study the Word of God, it's very clear. Jesus told them over and over and over again that He was the Christ, He was the Messiah, He was the Son of God, He was the only way to salvation. So for these intellectual men to come to me and make such claims, I give them a grade of ignorance. And I say ignorance because obviously they've never picked up their Bible because their Bible would tell them the same thing I have. So I give them a grade of ignorance. But you know what? That's not what's taking place with these religious leaders. They're not ignorant. Church, they're hard-hearted. Here's my problem with these men this morning. They know who Jesus is claiming to be. They simply say, I don't want you in my life. I don't want to respond to who you say you are. I don't want you. I like my life just the way it is. I'm in charge. I lead. I do things my way. I don't want you as Lord. To which I find myself in very good application for us this morning. I want you to listen to this. We need to be very careful today, September 1st of 2019, that we don't fall into either one of these categories. First, in the category of ignorance, which I fear a lot of America is today. What's the category of ignorance? We don't even take the time to study the Word of God to find out who Jesus says He is to us. There are a lot of people today that I find themselves just like those intellectuals that came to me. They're very smart. Man, they are some educated young men and young ladies. And they could probably have any job they wanted and make any, any amount of money they want. They could live life to the fullest. But they'll never take the time to study the Word of God to realize who God is and what He's done inside their life. That He went to an old rugged cross, church. And He died in my place and He died in yours. And in ignorance... They'll die inside their sins. Don't be that person today. Don't be that person that says, I don't even want to know, and just completely shrug off and never dig into the Word of God to realize who Jesus Christ is. But secondly, I want to charge us this morning this one. We here today need to be careful that we don't fall into the same category as these religious leaders who knew who Jesus claimed to be, but we never let him in. This is where Billy Graham steps into the church today. Listen to me very clear. Billy Graham, before he passed away, said that he believes 75 to 85% of the church could possibly be lost. That's a major claim. That's a major accusation against the church, is it not? Why would Billy Graham say that he believes that 75 to 85% of people that attend church on a regular basis are most likely lost? Because the Word of God tells us we'll know each other by our fruit, our actions, our lifestyles, the way we live, the things we say, the places we go, who we are. And he says this, when I look at many people that sit inside the church building today who claim to be the church, they don't live anything like it. So they're falling out just like these religious leaders. They knew the Word of God. Jesus stood before them, and yet they rejected him. They had never allowed Jesus Christ inside their life. 
I want to challenge us this morning. I want to charge us this morning. As your pastor, please do not base your salvation today on anything but by your relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you know him today? Can you look back on a time inside your life when you recognize the sin that you carried and realize your sin separates you from holy God, holy, mighty, just God, but that he sent his son, Jesus, his only son, Jesus, to go to a cross. And he died on that cross that he might shed his blood, his perfect, sinless blood. And it's that sinless blood that covers our life when we confess him as Lord, that covers us, propitiation. It redeems us. It buys us back. It justifies us, and it glorifies us. Do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord today? Don't fall into either one of these categories. Make sure today that we know Jesus as our personal master and Lord. I pray today Jesus is Lord of your life. Amen? Let's look at scene number four. They threw out the charge against Jesus, and number four is the challenge. The challenge, church, this is Jesus' response to these religious leaders' charge of blasphemy. And before I dig in on this one, there's something that just stuck out to me, and I realized that this is where I really wanted to hone in this whole, this whole scene, if you will. Church, I could not help but recognize this. I tried to put myself in Jesus' shoe here. As he's been before these individuals for three years now, publicly, he's not hiding, he, he's proclaimed the same truth Every single time. He's never deviated from what he says. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the only way of salvation. He's never deviated. And yet, guess what? Neither have they. They have never moved. They continue to accuse Jesus, to question Jesus, to batter Jesus, to take up stones, to try to kill Jesus. I tried to thought, think about this. How would I respond if I were Jesus in this manner? Jesus, the Son of God. He was there at the beginning, by the way, at creation. He spoke it into being. Do you remember? In just a couple weeks, we're actually getting to get into it. But you know your, your word as much as I do. In a few weeks, Jesus is going to be in the garden, and he's going to be praying. Do you remember when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus? And Jesus got up and said, I am. And when he said, I am, what did the soldiers do? They all fell back. That's the power that sits in our God this morning. So I'm thinking about, again, if I'm Jesus and here they are accusing me and they're standing there with stones in their hand thinking they're going to stone me, how would I have responded? Anybody want to fill my words in there? If I'm Jesus and they think they're going to stone me, I think I'm going to prove a point. But you know what? Here's what's really neat. That's not how Jesus responds. And I think there's something to be taught here. There's something to be learned. I caught this, church. Jesus never stops loving these men. He never stops sharing he never stops teaching. He never stops pleading with them. Even in the face of death, he never stops proclaiming to them the truth of who he is. Why? Listen to this now, church. Because Jesus knows the consequence of failing to place belief and trust in him. Listen to this passage. You all know it. This is probably the most famous scripture passage inside the word of God. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but will have everlasting life. Listen now. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be. Jesus didn't come for the purpose of condemnation. He came to save. So he realizes as these men are standing before him and they continue to deny him over and over again, he knows what the consequence is. Listen to verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He knows for them to fail to place their faith and their trust in him means that they are eternally condemned against him. Church, eternally condemned to a very real place called hell. You do know that hell is a real place this morning, do you not? Church, did you know that the Word of God mentions the word hell more than it does heaven? He talks about hell more than he does heaven. Why? Because he didn't come for the purpose of condemnation. He doesn't want anybody. I desire that none should perish, but that all should have everlasting life. Church, Jesus never stops teaching them. He never stops loving them, trying to lead them to this truth. 
So he responds with a challenge here in in scene number four, if you don't mind. I want you to listen to it. I'm going to pick up in verse 34. It's kind of an odd way he does it, but God's ways are not our ways. In verse 34, Jesus answered, Is it not written in your law, I said you are God's? If he called them God's to whom the word of God came, and he says the scriptures cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world you are blaspheming? Because I said I am the son of God. Kind of an odd word for Jesus to turn around and throw back at him. But church, I want you to think about this for a second. These religious leaders are standing there with stones in their hand, and they're ready to kill Jesus. Jesus doesn't back down. By the way, I want you to catch this now. They've got stones in their hand, and Jesus doesn't back down. He's not considering his own life here. He knows there's a message to be proclaimed. There's something for us to be learned there as well. He never backs down even when his life is in danger. Yet how many times are we sitting in our workplaces amongst our family or amongst our friends when the faith subject comes up? And all of a sudden everybody turns to the table and they look back to us and they go, well, you go to church. And all of a sudden we start cowering back. We start quivering. Well, yeah, 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 but, but, but. Jesus never backs down. They got stones in their hands and he doesn't back down. There's something to be learned for us there this morning, church, to be proud inside of our faith to know what Jesus Christ has done for us. But instead of backing down, I want you to notice that Jesus literally turns and points them back to the word, another good word for us. Instead of trying to figure out a good word to say, Jesus just points them back to the word, and he begins to quote Psalm chapter 82, verses 1 through 6, and I'll put it on the screen. I want you to put it in context, because it's an odd thing that Jesus said to them, and I want to explain it what it was that Jesus was saying in Psalm 82. Psalm 82. Verse 1, it says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty, and he judges among the gods. Notice that word gods is a little g. It's not a capital G. He says, God stands, capital G, God stands in the congregation of the mighty, and he judges among the gods, little g. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? I want you to understand that God is actually speaking here to the judges of Israel. He's quoting Psalm Psalm 82 here is a direct quote from the book of Exodus as God is rebuking the unjust judges of Israel. Look what he says in verse 3. Here's here's how he really wants them to act. He says, defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. Listen again to verse 6 now. I said, you are God's, little g, and all of you are children of the Most High. This is what God's saying in the book of Exodus and here in the book of Psalms. As God's speaking to these unjust judges, he's referring to them, helping them to understand, as they stand as a judge over top of the people, as the people look to them, they see them in authority. They see them in a place of position of power and authority, almost as if they revere them as a God, little g. So God himself made this reference here in the book of Psalm and in the book of Exodus, and Jesus just turns around and quotes that back to them and says, all I'm telling you is that I'm the son of God, but that's been spoken of since back in Exodus. Why are you picking up stones to, to, to throw at me? Why, why are you wanting to kill me? Understand this. This is not even Jesus' main point. All Jesus is trying to do is to get these religious leaders who have stones in their hand, he's trying to get them to calm down for just a second so he can turn around and preach to them again. He said this so they would calm down for a second, and he turned around and he he began to preach again. Listen in verse 37. Immediately, the very next verse, he said, If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works. How many times has Jesus said this now? He went back to his same message. He said what was needed to get them to calm down for a second, and he went right back to preaching to them. He says, if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works. Why? That you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Jesus never stops loving them. He never stops preaching. He never stops proclaiming the truth of salvation. That's where I want to close this morning. Church, if you've not heard one word I've spoken today, don't miss this. I believe, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again because I believe it with all my heart. 
I believe we are living in the last of days. I do. Dave, how, how do you base that? Because people have been saying that for years. He says, you'll know. He says, pay attention, be aware. Watch the things that are taking place around you, and you'll know when the time is near. Church, it's near. And in the same way, I'm going to promise you something. Just as these religious leaders took up stones after Jesus, and they began to come after him and say, quit making these claims, quit, sp quit speaking that name, quit saying such things, or we're going to kill you, there's going to come a day when we're going to have to take the same stand. I believe that with all my heart. I was even listening to David Jeremiah this morning before I came in, and he was preaching a message very, very similar in the same stance of saying, I believe we are close to the day. He said he believes he's going to see it in his lifetime. He's not a young man. He said, I believe we're going to see it in my lifetime, that there's going to come a time when we're going to have to make a choice between our lives and our faith. Jesus is, and he never stopped proclaiming. He never stopped telling them what was necessary for their salvation. What will you choose inside your life? Knowing that we are living in the last days themselves. Church, will we do all things necessary, laying our own lives aside if that's what it takes, to make sure that we proclaim the name of Jesus above all else? There is a lost and dying world all around us. Some of them, some of us today, have them inside of our families. It might be our kids, our grandkids, aunts, uncles, moms, dads. Maybe it's our coworkers this morning, our friends. Maybe people inside of our social group, every single person inside this room today knows someone who does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. How much is it going to take to hold you back from telling them the truth of Jesus? When was the last time we told anybody about the name of Jesus? I remind you that that's why we're here today. That's why we exist. That's our purpose. I saw a perfect application inside both of these points this morning. The church, we need to be ready even today to lay down our lives to make sure they hear the name of Jesus above all else. But I'm going to take it one step further. Let's say today it was your last day. I did two funerals last week, two. I had the privilege of both of them of hearing testimony after testimony after testimony of individuals coming forward saying, I don't even have to think, I don't even have to wonder I know where they're at today because I watch them live out their faith every single day in front of me. If today were your last day and the preacher had the privilege of preaching your funeral, what would be said about you? If all these people in this small town of Chancellor, most of you grew up together, they, you've known each other your whole lives, what would people say about you? That's a man of God right there. Now, I'll tell you right now, I saw him in his younger days, but I saw when Jesus got a hold of his life and it changed everything. Man, did he love Jesus. Let me tell you about that lady right there. That's a prayer warrior. That woman right there spent hours on her face before God, praying for people, interceding for people. That was a woman of God. Or would they be looking at you saying, I hope so. I, th I think they were saved. Man, they, they were at church all the time. That, that's right. I saw him at church, and hey, I even saw him at the revival services. I know that they, they taught a Sunday school class, so I think so. What would they say of you? You know what I want said of me? This is my, my particular desire. I want the day that God says, done, and I take my last breath, I want hell to go, glad he's done. That's what I want. Because I believe that's exactly what they said of some of these men of God. Man, I'm glad Paul's dead. That man was a mule. He never stopped. He was hard-headed. He made sure, he told everybody about Jesus. Will they say the same thing about us? Jesus never stopped loving people, even when they were going to kill him. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you know him today? He's the only way to salvation. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes?